And now, from Doug TV International. I'm Doug Ferry. And I'm Edgar Jarens. And this is Too Real. We're in the Bare Bones studio in the Frankfurt neighborhood of Philadelphia. Today, we're going to talk about art, which we're going to talk about in every episode. And the focus is drawing today. Art education is in the dumpster, and we're going to explore that on today's show. I would like to see two things before I die. And maybe the most important is that I'd like to see drawing taught again universally in every art department and in every art school in the world. A lot of people don't know that if you go to art school today, you may well receive no instruction in drawing. And frankly, that's a sin. It's terrible what's happening to the students in most art schools where they're spending four years of art instruction and not learning the fundamentals, not learning any skills. Uh, they are learning art theory, how to talk about art, how to print up their business cards, how to try to promote themselves, but they're not learning how to draw. They're learning conceptualism. They're learning how to pull objects out of the trash. When we say dumpster, we mean literally dumpster. These people go around and find junk, like an old engine block on a pallet. That was a big show lately, wasn't it, Edgar? Well, you got to know the right people, because uh, if I went into the museum with uh, some garbage and put it on the floor, um, I'm not connected enough to uh, have that pro presented as my artwork. But, but, but a lot of, and if anybody's confused, if you don't go to museums, a lot of the stuff that's being shown today is exactly garbage. An old shoebox, a beat up piece of furniture with nothing else attached to it, no particular meaning ascribed to it. It's supposed to speak somehow, but... And believe it or not, that's the focus of most of the classroom discussion. They, they've somehow tried to make art easy, to make it intellectual, to make it easy, to make it something that you're just thinking about. They sit and put a bucket of water in front of them, and the teacher will lead a group discussion on why or why not is that bucket of water art. When what they should be doing when they enter art school is learning how to draw, and in particular, learning how to draw, paint, and sculpt the human figure from life. If you can draw the figure from life... You can draw and paint anything. Absolutely. There's, there's no question about it. And I remember my first day of art school, uh, I went to a not particularly good illustration school in Boston, but I had a fantastic drawing instructor. And I walked in, and before I could blink, the model had her clothes off and was standing up and... You know, I was a little taken aback with the sudden nudity and, you know, everything else that was, uh, you know, seemed unconventional. I remember about it. my first nude also. <laughs> Do you? I was 14. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I went up at the college when I was 16 once, when, when I was younger, but, you know, and I... I uh, I didn't know what to do, you know, but the the instructor told us, and you know, grab your pencil and draw her, you know, or draw him. It was a woman that day, but uh, you know, as often as not, we had men drawing a model. As often as not, we had men modeling, and uh, you know, we just dug right in, and that was my life for the next six years. And why shouldn't it be? Yeah. The the the. The thing that happens in a classroom, when you have a class, a group of students, and you have a model, and everyone is drawing that model, it's, there's something in that room, there's a magic in that room, 
And the human figure in all its shapes and forms is a beautiful thing. It's an outstanding thing. And trying to draw that figure in front of you is the central core of training. I cannot understand why anyone wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, and, and um, you know, drawing the nude is important because people say, well, why does it have to be a nude? It doesn't. I draw plenty of clothes figures. I draw all the time. I keep a sketchbook. But understanding the underlying structure is important. Learning some anatomy. I don't think you have to be an anatomy fanatic, but learning a little bit of bone structure and muscle groups is very, very has been very helpful for me. I don't know. And and what is our interest in uh, drawing the figure? We're well, people. We're human, <laughs> and that will not go away. And they can't take that away from us. And they can't take that drive. The uh, uh, the academics and and the uh, modernist push to destroy and eliminate all representational and realist artwork. And, 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 and something Edgar said, um, academic, that the definition of academic has changed radically in the last hundred years. A lot of people hear that and they think of the French academies and people doing these painstaking you know, drawings, um, you know, from the model that go on week after week. No, that's not what we mean. The new academic is um, the new academics in art school is typically run by the new breed of neo-modernists who really would like to see painting and drawing gone forever, I think. Well, we can't escape our time. Whatever we make, whatever we're drawing, is going through the sensibilities of the time. And an interesting thing about artwork, and I have a suspicion the reason for that is that they cannot draw and they cannot paint. So they've been eliminating drawing from the core curriculum of art schools for 70 years. And they've, uh, if a student arrives at an art school, they're coming from high school. And in high school, your focus really is re representational work, is drawing what's in front of you, doing realistic artwork. And they arrive at these schools and they're disparaged. They're told that that's old fashioned, it's not important anymore. And it's a real rip off of the students. Students should demand that they learn to draw in art school. It's a fundamental skill and a lifetime pursuit. They should demand that they have teachers that can teach them drawing. And the first two years when they're doing their foundation should be drawing, painting, and sculpting the human figure. And one of the reasons for that, we mentioned that we're human, but the other reason is the figure is the most difficult thing to draw and anyone can look at a drawing of a figure and you will see every single mistake. There is no hiding behind bad drawing. And Ang had a quote about that, I think. What did he say? There's no way to fake it. Yeah, no, there really isn't. To fake the human figure to do it right, there's no way to fake it. Um, and I, I, you know, you hear the neo-modernists, and that's my term for postmodernists, post-postmodernists, uh, relationalists. There's so many splinter groups of modernism now that it's uh, difficult for most people to keep track well, of. Well, we'll keep it simple. Yeah, neo-modernism. <laughs> and if you don't like it... <laughs> Turn the podcast off. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, they're... They're, they insist that we want to go back to the French academies. And I don't know. I, I was trained by modernists. I was taught to draw by people who had learned from modernists. There's no more French academies. There's no more salons. There's people who are trying to go back to that, and God bless them. But uh, it's not me, and, I, and it's not Edgar. And, uh, you know, I like the way I draw. And um, I, I don't want to copy another person's style or anything else. I, you know, if your drawings are going to be 
successful, if your drawing skill is successful, your paintings are, it's going to be because it looks like your work. You know, that it has some individuality, which most neo-modernism utterly lacks. That's a discussion for another time. I was going to say, though, that drawing is not relevant because it's traditional. It's relevant because it's the only way to tell people visually about the world around you. And it's like writing, you know, if you want to write, if you want to, you know, if you want to traffic in words, you have to know how to write. If you want to traffic in the visual arts, you need to learn how to draw, I believe. It's fundamental and it's the core of all artwork. It's the core of painting. If the drawing is not done well in a painting, it comes right through and everyone can see it. There's a weakness to the painting. And, and as you said earlier, Edgar, that, that drawing should be life drawing. Drawing and painting from life should be the core curriculum of any good art school or any good art program in a university. And it's an interesting thing. When you're working from the figure, the figure moves, they shift, they settle over time. And that's exciting and that's interesting. And, and, um, and, and the other thing about drawing, if, if you look at any drawing, look at the old masters, there's an old, um, one of the old rules is a bad line leads to a good line. You look at them correcting and moving and shifting the figure and finding a way to draw that hand better. And, and the old masters, they left those marks. It's very interesting. And the next time you look at uh, an old master's uh, uh, drawing, or any, any drawing, take a look at how they adjusted their uh, original lines. And, and yeah, because typically too, I know when I draw, I draw from the general to the specific. I'll draw the shape of the head. That's how you get a likeness, not by starting with an eye and, you know, which is how beginners always do it. But, you know, in, in art school, you learn not to do that. You learn a lot of things about drawing that, uh, and that are not intuitive. And that's another uh, art rule, work from the broad to the specific. Yeah. Yeah. Drawing from life, too. I've found that the portraits I've done from life, sometimes I've had to do them from photographs, but the ones I do from life always look more like the person because you get a feeling for who they are, the way their muscles move, the way they are when they were, are relaxed or stressed. We see in three dimensions when we're looking at something. A photograph is inherently two-dimensional, and there's no... I have no problem, I use photographs all the time, but my training was from life. And when you get a really proper, good training, you're able to override the problems that are in, pho in photographs, and you're able to m create a three-dimensional form from what is a two-dimensional flat uh, a photograph. Yeah, I, I kind of forget that I'm looking at a photograph, and I'm certainly not. There's a difference between what you might call camera corrected, which is where you're using the photograph as, as a reference, and camera conditioned, where you're simply copying the photo or copying the photographic style. And that brings us back to art school and to art training. If you're if you don't have that understanding of form and that way to translate what's in front of you, uh, you will always carry through the problems inherent in photography right onto your drawing or onto your painting. So the training is, is central. It's, it, it's, I can't stress how important it is to work from life. And you may ask, uh, who are these guys to be criticizing you know, modernism? Well, we're both people who've been making our livings and, and, and successful realist painters and, and draftsmen uh, since we were 19. And, you know, how did we do it? We learned skills. We learned how to draw. That was the beginning. That's the core. And with the skill sets, by learning, learning how to draw, working from life, that began learning how to paint uh, again, working from life. And 
that training and working all day long from the figure, from life, gave us both the skill sets to be able to make a living out of painting and out of uh, uh, art. I think that's it for today. What do you think, Edgar? That's a wrap. Next time we're going to talk about Martin Lang, a well-known professor in England who believes that drawing, learning how to draw, is bad for students. So next week, we're going to rip him to shred. There's a bonus feature after this, and people may think it's kind of derogatory at first, but I think people will be very satisfied with the way it uh, comes out in the end. So this has been Too Real. I'm Doug Farron. And I'm Edgar Jarens. And I hope we see you again here next week. Don't forget to check out our blog at www.2-real.net. Hey, Edgar. Yeah. What time is it? Time to destroy modernism. Yeah. <laughs>
And Clam, he says, why? And the government man, he says, well, I've been driving around for a week and I can't find none. And I got a $50,000 grant here that I got to give away in this county or I ain't giving it away. And Clam says, now you're talking about art grant and the government man, he says, "My well, yes, I am. And Clem says, well, it is your lucky day because I am an artist. And the government man, he says, no. And Clem, he says, yes, I am. And the government man, he looks damn right excited, you know, because I guess he's just glad to get this monkey off his back. Clem says, you can call what I do, you can call it outsider conceptualism. Well, the government man, he perks up even more, looks to Clem like Clem knows what he's talking about. Clem looks at me, says, Seth, just remember I was showing you that the other day, that, that thing I was working on about the engines and shit, you know? I kind of nodded weakly, you know, I didn't want to blow his cover, but I was totally lost. But, you know, Clem, he's quick, and I forgot to mention that he actually went to college, community college, for three months. So Clem says, yeah, well, come on out to the garage, and I'll show you what I've been working on. So I follow along, and the government man, he come out. Well, Clem, he'd been working on his car, right? So he had the engine block out there on the tarp that was lying on a old wood pallet, and he says the engine block represents the engine of the media and society and i mean he said you know the whole media the 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 televisions and the social media it is this enormous magnificent perhaps but monstrous force that is just asylum us and we are not being overrun by people. We are being overrun by an idea that is so tangential, I think you said, and solid. It is as real as this cell phone in my hand. Well, the government man heard that. He looked like he had just heard the most beautiful music he had ever heard and he was serious shaking his head you know like he had heard the voice of god well anyway clam goes on you know saying in fact people are leaving appalachia the only people come down here now are yankees fucking yankees looking for summer so people are leaving and he finds that incredible because of its awesome natural beauty and he says you know we have this appalachian kind of sophistication that goes entirely unappreciated well when clem said sophisticated i bust out laughing and i had to pretend i was choking you know because uh Man, that was just craziest shit I ever heard, you know. Anyway, the thing about Northerners, that almost made me chuckle too. I had to pretend like I had a scritch in my throat because I remember somebody telling me about our friend Rebel. Now, she was christened Rebel Flag, but everybody just calls her Rebel, right? Anyway, she ran into one of them northerners down at the gas and sip, and I guess it was, you know, just one of those things anyway, so... You know, they're muttering something about how it's a good thing they can't fly that fucking flag anymore. And Rebel, you know, she says to her brother, her little brother, who's over there trying to break into a car, that Robert A. Lee, you get over here this minute. And when they hear Robert E. Lee, they start laughing, and she walk over, and, and she whipped out her jackknife and, uh, you know, said, Hey, that flag, we can't fly it. And we do fly it, and then she demonstrated the superiority of the South with her jackknife on the hood of their black Mercedes Benz. And she said, you know, we damn near won that fucking war, and what if we had, huh? And he said, you know, why are you Southerners always thinking that you could have won? 
and he almost met the business in that jackknife in his stomach, but he was surprisingly quick for someone as chubby as he was. Anyway, I'm getting off topic, as Clem would say. Well, anyway, he's saying, you know, we got no place to show these. We got no community art center down here in the government, man. He kind of laughs, and he says, you know, son, these are uh, too good for no community art center. Right, we gotta get you to the big city. You know, Clam, he's taken a bit by surprise himself, and I can see that glitter in his eye like he's starting to think already. You know, maybe I is an artist, right? So anyway, the government man, we all walk back outside. The government man, he says, you know, I'm very excited, and I will, in all probability, be back tomorrow. He takes Clem's phone number, takes down the address, and he drives off in his big old impala. Well, the next day come back, and he gave Clem right then and there a check for $50,000. And Clem was the recipient of the Appalachian Artistic Frontiers Grant for new and exciting art. Well, the government man, he gave Clem a big hug and said, he had not been this excited, and he couldn't remember how long, and he just thought Clem was the greatest thing since sliced bread, and he would be in touch. Now, I don't know who the fuck set up that grant or where they got the money, because there really ain't no artist around here. You know, there's people who knit and shit and make coffee tables out of old stumps, you know. But anyway, so Clem... I, he told me later that he had read, while he was at community college, he'd read two issues of Art Forum, which he said was just bullshit, but you know, people were always trying to suss out what it meant and stuff, and I said, well, what does it mean? And he said, it don't mean nothing. He said, it's just fucking words, you know, but you use them right and clever and in the right place and the right time, and people think you're an intellectual. A week later, they said, Send the Learjet down over to New Paswell, you know. We live over Cumberland Gap Way. We actually live like, well, they call it a park. I don't even think people around here know when they made it a park, but, you know, doesn't matter. Anyway, so they sent him a Learjet down to New Caswell, and anyway, he'd spent the night before with his Emery, his girlfriend, you know, and... I know Emory means brave, right? It's got a real meaning, but I also know that her mother named her after the boar, right? But anyway, so Emory come, and I come back down to New Caswell to see him off out on the tarmac, you know, at this little dinky airport. So Emory's like yelling at him. He didn't want to take with it. Well, he can't, you know. They just, well, he probably could have. Shit, they wouldn't let him do any fucking thing and paid for it with a smile. But he said he couldn't, and you know, I don't know, Henry wasn't real happy. And so she's like in her pink fuzzy slippers and her panties and a tank top that didn't cover her midriff, you know, that she woke up in. Following him out across the tarmac to the Learjet, yelling at him and hitting him in the head and the arm in the entire way. I didn't even get a chance to say goodbye to him. So, anyway, Clint goes to New York. Next thing I know, there's a little thing in the New York Times about him. And saying that this fantastic, uh, this conceptualist just dropped out of Appalachia, you know, from nowhere. That he's a genius, that he represents a return to formalism, the real formalism and materialism of the original, you know, Marxism, right? I was like, he called me to tell me that I, it's not like I get up on Sunday morning and read the fucking New York Times, right? Because I don't. But I did this Sunday, and it was just a little thing, you know, in like the back of the art section. But I was, you know, I was like, man, this guy's, you know, clam fuck, right? And I say, Clem, I remember Papa Enos talking about formalism and how it relates to 
communism. Are you like a communist now? He's like, fuck no, man. These guys are, they think they're fucking communists and they think they like Mark, but you know, they forget that the uh, previous generation of modernists were like the highest paid artists in history, right? They were fucking communists. You know, they were rolling in it and they were supported by people with great political and, you know, societal influence, like the Whitney's and the Rockefellers. So I'm like, well, all right, I guess. Hey, uh, Clam, is there a chance I can be an artist? And he's like, yeah, I don't see why not. You know, it's not hard. I just, you know, I just listen up and write things down when I don't understand them. I just Google it all later, right? So I said, well, how's Emery? You know, you talk to her. And he's like all quiet. And I say, yeah, Clem, what's going on with Emery? You know, you guys have been sweethearts since, uh, like, sophomore year. He's like, well, you know, I met, uh, you know, he said, have you ever heard of, uh, Gwendolyn Thompson, and I'm like, the model? And he's like, yeah, well, I met her at this party, right? And someone introduced me as like the new leader of the real formalism, and she was just like all over me. I was like, Gwen Thompson was all over him, and he's like, man, you got no idea what it's like up here, man. You come up here with a hick accent, but they tell him you an intellectual? Man, you just, you special as shit. Well, anyway, I gotta go, but I'll be back to tell you some more next time. Anyway, here's looking at you, and, you know, I guess fuck them if they can't take a joke, right? I'm Doug Farron. I'm Edgar Jarens. And this has been Too Real, recorded in New York City and in the Bare Bones Studio in the Frankfurt neighborhood of Philadelphia. All material, copyright Doug Farron and Edgar Jarens. Except music, copyright Doug Farron. All material, copyright 2019. Thanks very much for joining us, and we will see you again next week. This has been a production of Doug TV International.
production of MTV International.